All right, so we'll get going. Welcome to EMS Challenge with uh, Birmingham Fire and Rescue at Station 2 today. If you're in the Birmingham area, come on out. We got lectures 9 to 11. And then we're doing skills lab starting at noon. We'll have surgical airways on some pig traits. Um, if there's some volunteers, we could use y'all too, but no obligation. Um, we're going to do some airway management training, uh, do some mega codes, and then we have some ultrasound training as well. So if you're in the area, come on out. There's plenty of room. We got lunch provided by uh, GoPro. Go Rescue. Sorry, I got in trouble again, I'm sure. Uh, and they'll be here in a little while as well. So for those of you not familiar with the EMS Challenge, it's a uh, Con Ed program we started several years ago to bring more physicians that Con Ed back into the area. Um, the big push for this is to improve patient outcomes, to keep people alive. Um, so we started out doing one class a month, uh, and we're growing to doing the, the second and fourth Wednesday of each month. With the fourth Wednesday, we do skills labs. Um, hopefully, uh, within the next six months to a year, we'll start doing skill labs in the Birmingham region once a month, then on the road once a month as well with the fire college. So that's the goal for this. For your Con Ed, if you're in the room, there's a QR code you can scan and get Con Ed, fill out a survey. That'll be emailed to you within the next three or four days. There's a link in the uh, chat box you can uh, click and go with. Or you can always go back and email alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com to get your Con Ed as well. So. Upcoming events we got in April, the Critical Care Transport Medical Conference is in Orange Beach. It's a national conference. It's signed a five-year contract to do uh, their uh, education in Birmingham, in, Birmingham, um, in Alabama. Uh, so pretty close to us. I'd recommend going there if you have time. It'll be, I think, the week of the 14th. I could be wrong, but you can Google that. Um, April 13th, we're back at Centerpoint with Dr. Brown and Dr. Taylor talking. On the 20th, we're on the road again. We'll let you know where we're going to go uh, before the end of the week, hopefully. And then in April, uh, there's FDIC up in Indianapolis and Jim's Con. So if you're available, get that going. There's a uh, difficult airway class in May being hosted by Pelham and it's posted to our website and Facebook. And then in June, the uh, American College of Emergency Physicians has a conference in Sandestin and the Alabama group is there. Uh, we're going to be doing a boot camp uh, that can be geared toward EMS and some EMS talks as well. So a lot of cool things coming out. And then the coolest, most scariest thing is uh, April 29th. New protocols that are on the state website uh, go into effect. Um, so if you work in a place where I'm over uh, as your medical director, we've kind of gone over the protocols. We've been breaking out some new stuff with you. If the Birmingham region and need help with protocol training, please reach out to me. We can get that taken care of. Uh, there will also be uh, kind of a uh, uh, medical director's thought on the new protocols posted to the Brim's webpage any day now. So any questions or comments within reason so far? I feel like I'm in church. It's like way too quiet. All right, sweet. There you go. All right. All right. So first case, uh, this is a 60 ish year old male. Uh, he fell off a lime scooter. Um, you see those downtown a lot. I can't ride them, that's for sure. Uh, so get on scene. You see this guy, you see his face He's sitting upright, some empty uh, beer cans around him. What are some concerns or thoughts for this guy that y'all might have? I won't harass the people up front yet. What'd you say? Brain bleed, yeah. Go straight to the big thing, right, yeah. So if you look at the new protocols, you know, we kind of typed out, there's a pathway of the A, the B, the C's, things we've always done. But things you also want to think about is, you know, getting an appropriate history in these folks that they're able to talk to you to find out what's going on. And the purpose of a history is to risk stratify your patients. It's not just to fill out the checks, you know, who cares if they own a vitamin or a Tylenol, <clears throat> okay, take allergy medicines. And I really say, who cares sometimes what blood pressure medicines they take, right? But the things we want to find out are the things that matter, the stuff that matters. So uh, in an older person related to trauma, what are some questions that might be appropriate to ask them? The STMs. Blood thinners, yeah, yeah, this is America. If you look at the amount of people that are on blood thinners, it's supposed to increase by like 50% over the next five years. So everybody is on blood thinners these days, right? What type of people get on blood thinners? What conditions make you want to get on a blood thinner? So AFib, right. So yeah, so if you got somebody that you just, you're doing your quick assessment, you've kneeled down, you're talking to them, you can say, hey man, are you going to take any blood thinners? You can reach down and feel the pulse. If it's irregular, you know they're an AFib. 
If they get appropriate health care, they're probably on a blood thinner. So in your mind, you should be thinking already, all right, I got a dude that's been drinking beer, fell off a scooter and smacked his head. He's a high risk for whatever. Where'd you go? Okay. Okay. It's like, wait a minute. I've got a brain bleed, right? So high risk for intracranial hemorrhage, right? Things that kill people. And that's how we risk stratify them, right? So if he was on a blood thinner, I'm going to move a little bit faster as far as my assessment, my evaluation, and I'm going to go and start planning the fact that, okay, old dude been drinking on blood thinners, smacked his head, probably needs to go to the hospital. So I'm going to be calling for ALS if they're not there or transport and think about moving toward the hospital, okay? So there's a reason behind why we ask these history questions and not just to fill out the box, okay? Um, so blood thinners. So uh, other medicines that can affect uh, trauma patients, beta blockers, people who have hypertension on a beta blocker. Uh, if you take a beta blocker and now you get hypovolemic, does your heart rate go up? It does not. So normally you get a response to hypovolema, hypovolemia or trauma, you get increased heart rate. If you're on a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker, those things can actually make it where you don't get tachycardic and kind of throw you for a loop there. So things to think about, all right? And other things you can pick up by just looking at the patient, right? So if the patient is five foot four, 380 pounds, that tells you they probably have some underlying health problems, right? Potentially hypertension, diabetes, probably some underlying heart failure, heart disease, and those folks are at higher risk for having bad outcomes. So just looking at them, a quick appearance of them gives you some idea of what's going on. The other mnemonic I like is DFUP because I can use kind of inappropriate humor in a non-inappropriate way and get away with it, right? So I think about things that matter. So don't forget to underline pharmacology or anatomy and physiology. There was an industrial uh, injury not long ago. A guy got his hand caught in a grinder <coughs> and had pre profuse bleeding from there. All right, EMS arrived on scene, did direct pressure, got the appropriate history. He was still bleeding, didn't work, so threw a tourniquet on. Tourniquet went just below the elbow. Does that actually help the patient a lot? Tourniquet below the elbow. No, it does not. Why not? Right, yeah, you got two bones down there. So when you crank that thing tight, it's not gonna occlude the artery, okay? So the tourniquets go high and tight. The patient should not like you when to put a tourniquet on. They should actually call you names if they're awake. It should hurt, right? It's hard for people to apply tourniquets for themselves. So the anatomy, physiology matters. Two bones, tourniquet placement doesn't do a lot of good. That thing's gotta be high and tight to control the bleeding. Does that make sense? The other thing you got to remember is a lot of times the history you ask your patients, they don't have a clue. Um, sometimes they don't know what medicine they're on, that blue pill, that yellow pill. Sometimes they change the stories. It's a joke in the hospital when we have the, uh, the medical students and the residents go in to see a patient, they'll get a history from them, all right? Then I'll go in and get a completely different history. People change the stories sometimes, right? So a lot of times you got to look at the medications they take. You got to look at the patient, determine do you think they're sick or not sick? what kind of underlying health problems they have, and do those things affect what's going on with them right there. Then alcohol. I know nobody here drinks. I guess we could take a survey. Who is an Alabama fan? Raise your hand. Okay, so y'all drink. Who's an Auburn fan? Very good. You do worse, right? That's worse. <laughs> so alcohol does a lot of things. Alcohol, one, leads to people to do things that get them hurt. And they don't care they're hurt, right? And don't recognize they hurt, right? And alcohol has other issues as well. Alcohol use leads to some liver problems. And liver problems lead to making people at higher risk to die from traumatic injuries. So alcohol is metabolized by the liver. What alcohol does is it jacks up the inside of the liver. So when the blood returns from the gut and it's filtered through the liver, as the liver begins to die, that blood backs up, all right? You get portal hypertension. And that leads to increased risk of splenic injuries. It leads to increased risk of gastric bleeding. All right. Because the liver also makes proteins that clot blood and nourish the body. If you have liver disease and drink a lot of alcohol, you become anemic. So you have less blood supply. So when you start bleeding out, you have a worse outcome. And the liver also makes the proteins that clot blood. So if you have an injury and your body goes to clot it off, if you have significant liver disease, you can't clot those bleeders off. So you bleed more. So you see folks with alcohol disease, people who drink a lot, a lot of the homeless population with underlying uh, mental health issues that use drugs are high risk for liver disease, 
high risk to have an increased risk of bleeding, high risk for increased risk of being anema, anemic, anemic early on. So big risk of dying for even minor uh, falls and injuries. OK, so that's the way I kind of think about getting my history and determining if somebody's sick or not sick and how I'm going to manage them, even with minor falls and injuries. OK. Chief Ward likes cats, so I like to put cats up there. All right, so let's talk about some head injuries real quick. So when you think about uh, basic anatomy, you have the skin, you have the skull, you have the dura, and you have the brain, right? So folks who fall, sometimes what happens is that brain will shift around in there. You've got vessels that run between that dura. That's a kind of like an organic strand wrap, right, that covers the brain. People who have used uh, drugs chronically, older people, people who drink alcohol, they get atrophied, the brain shrinks a little bit, and these vessels that run through that dura get stretched. So even minor falls with these people will stretch these and cause subdural or intracranial bleeding. So old people, alcoholics, folks that use uh, drugs chronically get uh, cerebral atrophy, and they're at higher risk for brain bleed. So even a simple fall from standing can make them have a bad outcome versus someone who's younger and healthier, not drinking a lot, not doing the drugs, those guys can take a bigger fall. When you think about head injuries, I think about three types. I think about a subdural, that's a bleed. It's a venous bleed that's under this dura. It's usually slow and onset. So this is the person who has a fall, they smack their head, they're a little bit nauseous, they have a headache, and over the course of hours to days, they become more altered and unresponsive. You can have an epidural hematoma, and that's usually associated with the cranial fracture, and that's bleeding above this organic saran wrap, and that's usually arterial and it's faster. The classic presentation is somebody who falls, they smack their head, they become unresponsive, they wake up, they're back to the baseline-ish, and then 20 minutes, 45 minutes later, they become altered, they start seizing. Those people, that's a surgical emergency. They should have been in the OR, you know, 30 minutes before. Some people with subdurals, we can kind of watch them for a while. If they're not on blood thinners, we can kind of observe and not go to the OR. But epidurals always go to the OR. The third place you bleed is inside the brain itself, uh, in a, a subarachnoid or in a parenchymal inside the brain. Those are tough because you really can't go into the brain for surgery and pull that blood out because you jack up the good brain. So we can fix subdurals and epidurals, the subarachnoids, the interparenchymals. Those folks are in a bad spot. All right. So same case-ish, except this time the guy is now altered. He kind of moans to painful stimuli. He's got abrasions to his face and scalp like we saw earlier. His belly's a little bit distended. It's, you know, like a type two Alabamian, <laughs> type one type. Um, and uh, heart rate's 130s, blood pressure is 90 over 60. He's breathing about 26 times a minute. All right, his SATs are fine at 95%, and his glucose is like in the 160s. So is this guy sick or not sick? Sick, right? Yeah, so I define sick as somebody that I look at, and in my mind, I think they may die in the next five minutes to an hour, okay? This is the real emergency patient we're gonna take care of. So I got a dude that's got facial uh, contusions, he's altered, tachycardic and hypotensive, he makes me very uncomfortable. So this guy gets the full hands-on, right? He gets the airway, I'm gonna go hands on his head, I'm gonna do C-spine immobilization, I'm gonna look in his airway, make sure there's nothing obstructing that, I'm gonna do a jaw thrust. If he's got a gag reflex, I may slide a nasal trumpet in him to kind of give an extra little airway. Now, if he's got facial trauma, he's got bony instability, I put nothing in his nose, right? That can be a problem, all right? I'm gonna expose his chest, I'm gonna look at his breathing, I'm gonna get a rate, work of breathing, I'm gonna lay hands on his chest, I'm gonna feel for crepitus. I'm gonna run my hands down across his belly, I recognize it's a little bit distended, I look for trauma, all right? And I'm doing all this, as one of my partners has put him on the cardiac monitor, he's on the SAT monitor, we're starting IV access, we're doing all that at once. So this guy's fairly ill, all right? So what all could be going on with this guy? We've got an older guy, lives on the street, Smells like alcohol, who's now altered, hypotensive, and tachycardic. What could be going on with him? It could just be malnourished. That's right. All right. What else? Nobody even cares. I like this. Roll tide. You could have a brain bleed. Yeah, right. So same like we talked about earlier. Still could have a head injury, right? What else could be going on with him? Could be drunk. 
Yeah, he could be drunk and dehydrated. Yeah. Could he have been shot? If he's in Birmingham, it could have been shot, right? So, you know, sick people, you expose them, get them naked, look them over, look for holes and life threats and patches, things that can really mess them up, right? So lots of things could be going on. His belly's distended, so that makes me think of a couple of things. One, he has bad underlying liver disease, because remember when you have liver problems, you get a backflow of blood uh, coming out of the liver. It causes ascites, your, your belly swells. So he could just have ascites, right? Big fluid, uh, fluid in the belly. The other problem with that though is with liver disease, we already talked about you get increased risk of bleeding. You get increased pressure on the spleen. The spleen gets enlarged. So this guy could have a belly full of not just ascites, it could be a belly full of blood. So he could have fallen, taken a small ding to his spleen, and now he's got blood in his belly. So this is just a CAT scan, a way to cheat at the hospital to figure out what's going on with people. The way you look at these is you imagine the patient's head is in the wall, their feet are coming out and they're looking up. And this is the spleen right here. And this dark stuff around is blood. So this is somebody who's had an enlarged spleen, they're taking a fall. That spleen is kind of like a uh, almost eggshell type stuff and it cracks and breaks and it bleeds around there. And this will kill somebody, okay? About 25% of your blood supply is in your spleen at one time. If you got one, the spleen kind of refilters the blood. So a fractured spleen or ruptured spleen can cause pretty significant bleeding, all right? How do you control bleeding on somebody internal? How would you control bleeding from a ruptured spleen in the field? Drive really fast, right? TXA, yeah. So really you can't put direct pressure on that, right? There's no way to do that. So your job is to recognize people who are at risk for this. And if they fit the build and they're symptomatic, you recognize I can't fix this in the field. I can't fix it in the ER and then the surgeon. So this person is picked up. You do your assessment and your interventions as you head into the hospital. This is why we take trauma patients to the hospital quickly and our medical patients we work on seeing. But a ruptured spleen can get you. So just in the belly, it could be ascites, but in the guy that's older, been drinking, could also be a pretty good spleen injury. All right. So the portal hypertension I mentioned with the liver, basically what happens is that liver gets cirrhotic, it gets hard, blood supply cannot get through there. So the blood backs up in different places. It backs up in the spleen, it backs up. You'll see that these guys who have liver disease and cirrhosis, they get, have y'all heard of esophageal varices, right? So you get these big blood vessels that get engorged in the stomach and the esophagus, and they can rupture and bleed. Those folks die pretty quick. You also get the same thing. They get big hemorrhoids that can rupture and bleed. Most of the time hemorrhoids are uh, annoying, but not life-threatening. And the guy with liver disease, they can be pretty bad. And then sometimes you'll see on their bellies, I'm not sure if I got a sign for that. Um, they'll have uh, varicose veins in their stomach as well where the veins are engorged. So folks with underlying liver disease, chronic alcohol use, high risk, high risk for bad outcomes and even minor trauma. And then y'all mentioned brain bleed for this guy as well. So this is a subdural hematoma. This is bleeding under that dural we showed earlier. All right, and the older guy has been drinking. And this is the CAT scan. Again, that their head's that way, feet are this way, they're looking up. And that arrow points to a white line, and that's blood under that dura. And it doesn't look smooth because it's under the dura, and it kind of fits, the blood kind of seeps into the grooves of the brain. This is an epidural hematoma. This is the one that usually comes from arterial bleed and from a fracture. And you can tell this looks nice and pretty, right? That's because it's above this organic saran wrap, the dura. And so it's got a smooth line to fill. And again, this person, you can tell how the brain's already being pushed and shifted over. This person needs to be in the OR 10, 15 minutes ago. These folks, if we can get to them quickly, and they can surgeon go in and decompress that, take a piece of the skull off, get that blood out, they'll live a normal life, no harm, no foul. But if we can't do that quickly, they can either have bad brain damage long term, okay, or they can die. This is a subarachnoid, okay, this is a deeper bleed. This is done usually from shaking somebody that has a rollover MVA or the child abuse. And this is deep bleeding into the brain. Again, this, not a lot we can do from that. That blood gets in there, the brain starts to swell. It puts pressure on the good tissue in the brain, and we have bad outcomes with that. Again, in the field, it's really hard to recognize whether you got a subdural, epidural, or a subarachnoid. 
Now, obviously, some things will give you some leeway, right? Dude, hit across the head with a crowbar, cracks a skull, probably a big epidural, okay? But the treatment for us in the field is going to be the same. There are three things that uh, we have to manage in the ER and in the field to keep people alive with head injuries. And the first thing is we cannot uh, allow them to become hypoxic, okay? We got to maintain the O2. I know for the, those of you guys that do ACLS, uh, in American, this is American Heart, there's a big push now not to use a lot of oxygen on people who are in hypoxic, in cardiac arrest, <clears throat> in strokes, in STEMIs. In reality though, hypoxia is bad and it's really bad for the brain. Hypoxia and low glucose is bad for the brain. But in head injuries, we gotta maintain oxygenation. So that guy we talked about, this altered hypotensive tachycardic, we've opened his airway, okay, we've done our quick assessment, we're checking the AccuCheck, somebody's starting the line, Somebody should be throwing O2 on this guy, okay? In the past, we've done non-rebreathers because that's high flow O2. In reality, a nasal cannula works pretty good. That's one of the things that COVID showed us is that you can really oxygenate somebody pretty good with a nasal cannula. So that dude, I put a nasal cannula on him, crank it up to eight to 10 liters. If you only got one tank of O2, that's the way you manage it, right? If he starts to lose his airway, if he's not breathing well, then you can pull out your Ambu bag and your mask, put that over that nasal cannula, and you can ventilate over that, and your Ambu bag not even be attached to the O2, and you know you're still gonna oxygenate him, okay? It's called passive oxygenation. So these guys, you gotta give them oxygen. Even if his initial sat for 99%, if I got somebody altered with a head injury, they get more oxygen. Now, when you get to the hospital, sometimes docs are gonna fuss at you, and you just smile, and you say that I, not, I was not giving them supplemental O2, we were pre-oxygenating them before they arrested, right? So we changed our terminology and we're okay with that. But hypoxia kills brain cells. We gotta prevent that. The other thing we gotta prevent is hypocapnia. So who here learned that with head injuries you had to hyperventilate them a long time ago? Anybody remember that? So that was the mainstay of therapy years ago. Now we know that hyperventilating someone with a brain injury kills them. The reason we used to say hyperventilation was when you hyperventilate somebody and you blow off CO2, the vessels going to the brain constrict, so it decreases swelling. And you can only have so much room to swell in the brain because there's a skull around it, right? The problem is when you constrict those vessels, you also decrease blood supply to the part of the brain that's not injured. So you make outcomes a whole lot worse. So you do not hyperventilate anybody with a head injury. You bag them eight times a minute and call it a day. More than that, you can blow off CO2, you get basal constriction, they're gonna have a bad outcome. <clears throat> all right. And the other thing we gotta do is prevent hypotension. All right. So I know that you guys know about the studies that look at permissive hypotension and trauma. So GSW the belly, the guy's blood pressure is 90, heart rate is 120. Years ago, we flood those guys with four, six, eight liters of IV fluids. We found out that by doing that, we decreased their clotting factors, they had a worse outcome. All the studies that look at this though, of this permissive hypotension to let them kind of ride with that low blood pressure, excluded head injuries. And the point of that being is, you gotta have a good blood pressure to refuse the brain. So head injury patients, we gotta prevent hypotension. So these guys, that's why we give them a bolus of fluid. Um, do we give a bolus of fluid to folks in the stroke system? Yes or no? Yeah. And that's the rationale for it. Even if the blood pressure is high in a stroke, we still give them the blow of the fluid because the higher the better for the most part because it perfuses the brain. So we've got to prevent hypotension. There's a uh, guy named David Spate. I think it's David. Maybe it's Michael. Uh, you can Google the EPIC study. He's done a lot of work out in Arizona looking at head injuries, and he's shown that blood pressure is less than 90, um, have a worse case of long-term brain injury from just mild TBIs. <clears throat> and so he's even proposing at some point in the future that maybe these trauma patients, we start giving them low-dose pressors to keep their blood pressure up. So one of the things you'll see people with head injuries when we get them, uh, we intubate them or manage their airway, we see a syndrome when we hyperventilate people. So I can tell you in the ER now, when we go to intubate somebody, we relax them, we sedate them, we put a tube in their mouth hole, right? Then we come along and we start bagging them. The first few minutes, we're going like crazy, 20 times a minute, right? That's not good. All head injuries should get about eight times a minute. More than that is way too much. So you got to consciously think about these things so you don't hyperventilate the people. 
People talk about herniation. So that's when they get so much pressure in the brain uh, that the brain actually starts going down through the uh, spinal cord, right? Uh, herniation will be signs will be like a fixed pupil. The person who was kind of talking to you, now they start seizing, posturing, and they got one fixed dilated pupil and the other one's not reactive, and the other one's reactive, quick herniation. The problem is with herniation that some of the textbooks still talk about, we hyperventilate those people then, but the problem is how many people survive herniation outside the OR? Anybody know? None, right? So if you got somebody in the trauma bay, they start to herniate, they go straight to the OR, it's too late, right? Because it's gonna take more than five or six minutes to get that skull off and get them taken care of. My point to that is, if someone's gonna, if someone is herniating in front of you, their odds of them dying is about 100%, right? So we overcall herniation, we can't treat herniation in the field or the ER, so there's never a reason to hyperventilate head injuries, okay? Hyperventilation kills head injuries. We talked about airway management with head injuries. If you only got one tank of O2 on scene, I've got a nasal cannula on it, crank it at 10 liters. If you need to switch over and ventilate them, Ambu bag works great with that, but remember less than eight times a minute. Other things that we do in the hospital, and somebody mentioned earlier, is TXA. So years ago, we did the rock studies here. We talked about using TXA for head injuries. TXA is category A for paramedics for head injuries. Somebody with ultra mental status, known traumatic event. You can slide two grams of TXA every 20 minutes for those guys. We use it mostly for hemorrhagic shock, but it can be used for head injuries. And the theory behind that is if we think we have blood in the brain, we want that blood to slow down the bleeding, not get worse. And that's what TXA does. Semi inappropriate humor for the older people in the room. Chief Ward. All right, second case. This is a uh, MCC versus the ground. So, motorcycle, dude's wearing a helmet, but chunked off. Obviously, we're going to do airway management, C spine immobilization. Helmet's going to come off with some help, so that way we can manage it there when we need it. Quick hands-on assessment. Somebody's laying hands on the chest. We feel the crepitus, broken ribs, looking for trauma, okay? When I palpate the chest, I'm pushing laterally, sideways in. If I get my hands behind them, I squeeze. If they got broken ribs, they're not gonna appreciate that. They will call you names and you recognize it. You can feel it, right? The hands over the belly, gentle palpation. I'm doing a quick push over the pelvic area to make sure there's no fractures there. Having to move arms and legs real quick. And doing a quick assessment on them. So this dude's awake and alert, breathing 32 times a minute, a little bit tachycardic in the 116s, blood pressure is 110 over 60. Is that normal, high or low, that blood pressure right there? <clears throat> That's a trick question. Nobody's gonna say a word. Yeah, in Alabama, is that normal, high or low? In Alabama, that is low, right? That is what you want. Uh, but in Alabama, that is low, so that should make you uncomfortable, especially with a heart rate of 116, right? Is that an 87%? Obviously, that is low, okay? So on exam, his chest is stable. There's no crepitus. I don't feel any busted ribs, all right? He's got belly pain. He's got a little bit of distension of his belly. He's got increased work of breathing. He also has pretty severe left shoulder pain, but he can move that arm. So what's going on with this guy? So it could be a ruptured spleen. Why do you say ruptured spleen? Preferred pain. Yeah, they call that cur sign or something. I call it the duh sign, right? So belly's got distended belly, tender shoulder pain, but he can range that shoulder. So it could be referred pain. What else can call refer cause referred pain to that left shoulder that makes you hypoxic? What if I said he's got diminished breath sounds on the left, but not on the right? He could have a pneumothorax. I want to say it's tension, though. He's talking to us, but he could have a pneumothorax. What else can cause that on the left side? What if the, the bike behind him ran over his belly? What would you think? Now I'm getting blank stares now. I'm talking to my kids. This is great. All right, final hint. What if you heard gurgling like bowel sounds in his left chest? There you go, right, yeah. 
I can't hear vowel sounds up there, to be honest with you. It's usually too noisy and my hearing's not that great. But I can recognize there's no bony instability. I don't feel busted ribs. I don't feel crepitus. I got diminished breast sounds. I got abdominal pain. I got referred pain. So I can think, yeah, he may eject up the spleen, but he's also hypoxic. So either has a simple pneumothorax or he's got bowel in his chest, right? So if you think about the diaphragm, the diaphragm is a super thin muscle. Anybody been able to come to the cadaver labs with me lately? I had one a couple of weeks ago. I'll have another one hopefully in May and the one in August, but the diaphragm is a real thin muscle. If you get increased intra-abdominal pressure, the bowel, the stomach, the colon can be pushed up through that diaphragm into the chest wall. Pretty bad, they get hypoxic. The problem that we have in the hospital, is sometimes we think they have a big pneumothorax and we go put a chest tube in there and there's not a pneumothorax, there's gut in the stomach. And so we put a chest tube in somebody's colon in their chest. That's a bad day, right? So there's some risk there, but, um, but ruptured diaphragm. The other problem with that is, so this guy now becomes altered and unresponsive. So now you got to bag this guy. So you got an oral airway in or a nasal trumpet and you're bagging the guy and he starts getting worse. Why is he getting worse? Now his sats are 70%. He's got no breast sounds on the left. So you could have created a tension pneumothorax, right? Because you got a positive pressure and a pneumothorax or what else could have happened? When you bag somebody, does all the air go into the lungs or does some go in the stomach? So you increase the pressure in the stomach by bagging this dude and you can make that rupture diaphragm worse. So now he's ultra confused, I'm bagging the dude and more of his gut fills full of air and that pushes it up into the chest. So now at some point, he's got a lung on the right, heart in the middle and colon on the left. So he's gonna be hypoxic and have problems, right? So these are hard to figure out in the field, but you gotta put all your clues together, right? If he's mostly abdominal trauma, nothing in the chest, yeah, he could have broke a rib and has a small pneumothorax, they got worse with positive pressure ventilation. But you gotta about think about these things. So if you knew it was a ruptured diaphragm, what would you do to help him as you manage his airway, as you're bagging the guy? So if you got a video scope, you just go ahead and intubate him, get it done. So that way you know the tubes in the trachea, no increased intra abdominal pressure. The other thing we can do is medics are allowed to put a gastric tube in somebody. So this is a time when a gastric tube could actually save a life. You put an OG tube in them, that tube goes into the stomach, you hook it up to suction, it decreases that pressure. You may actually get some of that bowel out of the chest and make them breathe better, okay? So the diaphragm is a very thin muscle, easy to rupture on the left, not so easy on the right. Why don't we uh, rupture the diaphragm on the right a lot of times? What organ hangs out on the right side of the body? The liver, yeah. So if you push your liver into somebody's chest, uh, they're probably gonna die. That's a lot of force there. So the liver kind of sits a little bit on the left side, crosses all the way over to the right. If that ruptures the diaphragm, it's a bad day for everybody. So usually you see ruptured diaphragms on the left. This is another CAT scan, kind of looking at it. And this is a scalp film. So obviously the head's that way, the feet are this way, but you can see this is the diaphragm and that's the stomach coming through there. So that's somebody that in theory, they should go to the operating room pretty quick to get that push back down and get a chest tube in so we don't put a chest tube into the colon that leaks poop into the chest. People don't do well with that. Fractured ribs, usually fractured ribs if the person's semi-alert, if you mash on the chest laterally pretty hard, uh, give them a good squeeze. They don't appreciate it. You can pick up that. We mentioned a simple pneumothorax, and that's just where you get the rib punctures, the lining of the lung. So air leaks out of the lung when you breathe in, and it helps compress the lung. So you get a collapsed lung. These folks should be a little bit uh, increased work of breathing, maybe hypoxic. If you listen to them, you can actually hear you may have diminished breath sounds but they should be alert and talking to you. And that's a simple pneumothorax. In the field, we don't do anything for that, right? We don't decompress it. We just recognize it and now they need to go to the trauma center, right? It's just another scalp film. This is a, a scalp film, like a CT scan or a fancy X-ray. And if you look on the lungs there, on the left lung, there's all this white, that soft tissue. This is the typical alabamium, kind of chunky. If you look on the right, you see the lungs in the middle and there's air in the chest wall. That's a quick way for us to say, okay, 
I don't see a collapsed lung on that picture, but they gotta have one because there's free air in the soft tissue. And you can feel that on exam. You can feel those little crepitus on people and you can feel the air in the chest, but you can only feel it if you touch them, right? Um, so all you trauma patients get a quick hands-on assessment, lay hands on the chest, palpate for free air, all right? And then palpate for broken ribs as well. You can also get a hemothorax where you get, instead of just air in there, you get blood, a liquid that collapses the lung. And it's hard to tell the difference between the air and the blood sometimes, but the chest cavity is pretty vascular. So the different types of pneumothoraxes, obviously you can have an open, a guy with a big gaping wound, pushing air out. More commonly, you can see a closed simple pneumothorax. So they have a reason to have a pneumothorax, some kind of injury, blunt force trauma, GSW, they got crepitus, broken ribs, diminished breath sounds, increased worker breathing, maybe a little bit hypoxic. You treat that with assessment, recognizing it, a little bit of O2. And then a tension pneumothorax is when you get so much air in there that it kind of compresses the lung, pushes the great vessels over. And now you get no blood return back to the heart. So they're relatively anemic, right? Or hypovolemic. So for a tension pneumothorax, you got to have signs of a pneumothorax. You got to think they have a pneumothorax. And then to define tension is either cardiac arrest, that's poor cardiac output, or they're altered and have low blood pressure tachycardia. The state says the definition is um, cardiac arrest and then ultra minute status plus blood pressure less than 90, heart rate greater than 115, respiration is greater than 24, or signs of cardiovascular compromise. So my definition is they got to have a pneumothorax and now they're altered with poor perfusion. That's a tension pneumothorax. Okay. But they got to have a pneumothorax first. Location we can do this. You can do it at the uh, lateral, fourth, fifth intercostal space. That's the, uh, the most favorite place these days. Or you can still do it anterior as well. Um, let's see, where's my slide? All right, Chief, there we go. So this one's been out for a while. This video was done in Ukraine. I used to say just Google chest tube Ukraine, but you can't do that now. You get too many hits, right? But this is a uh, picture from the inside of the chest. That's the chest cavity. That's the needle going in. So needles in with a catheter. Right? Needle comes out. Catheter stays in. And now we just wait and watch. This is not a rapid release of air like you textbooks talk about, but that's the lung reinflating. You see that? So that's pretty cool. So you can do an anterior approach which is second to third intercostal place, midclavicular line, right? So you find the sternum, you find the shoulder, go right in between, fill one rib, go down one more, and go in and above it. I usually find a rib, aim the needle toward the rib, and then once I hit that rib, I kind of angle down and up and slide it in. Works pretty good. You want to go above the rib because it's less risk of bleeding or hitting the neurovascular bundle. If you hit the rib and go below the rib, who cares? Right? They had a tension pneumothorax that were fixing to die. You got the needle in the chest. Okay. So works pretty good. The um and again you can do the lateral space as well. If you want to, you can go in laterally. The problem I see with this is when you go fourth or fifth intercostal space laterally, you got to remember that with inspiration and expiration, that thin diaphragm moves and the lungs actually, the belly actually gets up to about the nipple line. So if you go too low, too low on that lateral approach, you can actually go under the diaphragm and get into the belly and not help somebody. I've seen a couple of cases of lateral decompression of a tension pneumothorax 
that didn't work and it's because they were under the diaphragm. The other problem is um, even the chunkiest Alabamian, I can pull their, 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 uh, their chest wall, their mass down and get in anteriorly. And then sometimes trying to get to somebody laterally that has a bunch of fat rolls, it's tough to get that needle in there, okay? So either one's approved by the state. Uh, it's category A for paramedics and attention pneumothorax, which is great. My advice is though, uh, make sure you know what you're doing. Make sure they got a pneumothorax. You can confirm that clinically and now they have signs of tension. If you're using an IV needle that has one of those no flow valves on it, once you put the needle in, you got to put a syringe on there and pop that off. If you're using some of these big spear needles or the military needles that come in a pin case, that's fine. But a regular IV needle or 14 or 16 gauge, you may have to put a syringe on it to pop that off. You can get enough tension from a hemothorax that will cause uh, signs of tension as well. And if you needle decompress a hemothorax, you're not gonna get much out of it, okay? Questions about needle decompression? The best way to practice this, I think, is on cadavers or in real life. You don't get a lot of real life experiences. Uh, I'll post my next cadaver lab online, hopefully, like I said, either May or August. And if you haven't done chest decompression, you ought to come out and do that with us. The state says you can also do tension pneumothorax for a flail chest. What's a flail chest? Anybody know? Anybody care at 9.35 in the morning? Yeah. Yeah. So it's multiple rib fractures that break off a segment of the chest wall. So you get a guy that's chunked off that motorcycle and he's got right side and left sided fractures and he's got that free floating area. The problem clinically is that usually most people can splint this with muscle contractions for the first 30, 45 minutes, maybe even an hour. So it's tough to see a flail chest in the field. But what you will pick up is they got busted ribs because when you squeeze, you can feel the crepitus. Sometimes you feel the air. If they're awake, they cuss you, right? And then 45 minutes, an hour later, when that muscle starts to relax, then you see a flail segment. Anybody with a flail chest that you know has a flail chest, that you're bagging them with positive pressure ventilation, either ET tube, eye gel, or an OPA, that person, if they decompensate even a little bit, they get a needle decompression. If you got multiple broken ribs, we know you have a pneumothorax. If you positive pressure ventilate somebody, it's gonna develop into a tension pneumothorax if you don't fix it. So these guys, we decompress their chest pretty quick. And that's category A in our state as well. What you don't wanna do is this, okay? So you can decompress the chest and if you got a 20 minute ride, the dude gets better. And then 10 minutes down the road, he drops his pressure again, drops his sat. You may have to re-decompress his chest because that's a little bitty needle, right? But stay away from the box. So stay away from the sternum because there's a heart under there and great vessels. Stay away from anything below the anterior nipple line, okay? Or anatomical nipple line, that anterior. Remember, nipple line should be about right here, right? Sometimes other folks have it in other locations, but you gotta stay high so you get in the chest wall, not the belly. That'll get you in trouble. Just a couple more CTs. That's that scout film I showed you. If you look at this one, this is again, heads that way, feet are pointing this way. That dark tissue there is the lung. The super dark stuff is air. So that's somebody with a big pneumothorax right there. If you look at that tube, I don't know if y'all can see that or not. That's an actual chest tube we put in for a pneumothorax. So that thing's about the size of your thumb, a lot bigger than the needles that we use. So those are big tubes. And I brought some today, we can talk about them in the lab as well. But I like the anterior approach for needle decompression. If somebody's laying on their back, where does air travel? It travels up. So I know that I got less chance of hitting good lung tissue and I'm gonna get the air out if I do it that way. Laterally, sometimes that doesn't work. This is the triangle of safety we talk about. So we're gonna kind of go mid axillary, to the nipple line, back up to the shoulder. Chest tubes go there, lateral decompressions go there as well, okay? And the other ways we manage this, anybody that has a pneumothorax has probably got some vascular injuries. We're doing blood products and plate this as well, or FFP, sorry. All right, last case. This is the dude minding his own business. And I uh, just got shot in the shoulder, like on TV. So is that a concerning wound, shot in the shoulder? Yes, 
On TV, it's not. In real life, it is. Because what does the shoulder actually live? Where does it live? In the chest, right? So a lot of big anatomy there. Uh, when small caliber weapons are used and hit that clavicle or the scapula, those bullets can ricochet around and do a lot of damage. So they can ricochet and hit the heart. It can damage big vessels in the neck. It can go down to the belly. Uh, so you just got to be very careful. That's a very concerning wound. That is a trauma alert that needs to see a surgeon, even if they look great initially. They could have got lucky and it could have just jacked up the, the shoulder blade. Uh, but if they did, that's a win for them. If they got unlucky, they can actually die from you in front of you pretty quick. Liver injuries, liver is pretty vascular, easy to hit, big organ. This is the CAT scan. This is the dude that was shot. This is his lung. All right, those are ribs. That's his back. That's his chest. Bullet went through there, but you see all the damage to the lung where the bullet didn't go through. That's just that velocity, that force. So these things can really mess people up. They can break the scapula, do a lot of damage. The unfortunate thing also is behind the scapula is a lot of arteries, right? The subclavian runs up right through there as well. So a lot of big vessels, high risk for hemothorax, high risk for vascular injury, high risk for distal arm injury, high risk for ricochet, damage to the esophagus of the heart. Another x-ray shot in the chest. All this white is blood. There's a little air point to a small pneumothorax. So there's air in there, but there's also blood. If you lay this guy back flat, he's going to be kind of gurgly because his lungs are full of blood. This is the guy that you got to sit up as well. He needs a quick chest tube. Let's talk about backboards for a second. Uh, we'll talk about more of this on the 23rd when I do kind of a protocol update, but Long backboards are going away, folks. They really do nothing to mobilize the spine. The only people that should be transported to the hospital on a light, long backboard are people with blunt trauma and are paralyzed. Everything else come off the board. Uh, I get it. If you got somebody that's 350 pounds and it's going to take you 10 minutes and six firemen to roll somebody off the board in the back of a rescue before you go to the hospital and they're sick, yeah, screw it. Keep them on the backboard, head to the hospital. That makes sense. But realize that long backboards don't do really anything to mobilize the spine, CTRL spine. If you got to use a long backboard to get somebody out of a car, down the steps, that's reasonable. They got a pelvic fracture or a femur fracture, and you want to secure them to the board to stabilize that, that's fine. But it's not really that useful for um, spinal injuries. And in penetrating trauma, there's no place for this. So if you don't see GSW to the belly, the guy's tachycardic, altered, can't move his legs, and you wait eight to 10 minutes to get a backboard to move him, you're hurting the guy. It doesn't matter. The damage is done. You roll him, you get him on the stretcher, you pick him up, you put him on the stretcher, and you head to the hospital. And then TXA, let's talk a little bit about TXA. TXA is the drug of the decade, I think. Um, TXA is a great drug for hemorrhagic shock. We kind of talked about using it in head injury as well. The way TXA works is uh, the body's response to an injury is that uh, a vessel is damaged, the body tries to clot it off. Is somebody drawing on my screen? That's pretty cool. Y'all see that? Okay, maybe I'm just saying things. Um, so the uh, vessel is damaged, the body sends cells there to clot it off. All right, a few minutes later, the body goes back and looks at that cell and says, uh, do we still need to clot off this vessel or not? So it unclots. If you keep bleeding, the body reclots. Okay. Eventually, you run out of clotting factors. So what TXA does is TXA tells the body, do not break down the clots. Anything that's clotted off, leave it there. So it prevents bleeding, decreases loss of blood, improves survival. Whether your bleeding's from something like a gunshot wound to your belly, from an amputation, or from a head bleed. So TXA is a pretty reasonable drug to use. Only contraindications for this would be if they've been bleeding more than three hours. They've already been bleeding for three hours. They've already run out of those clotting factors. It does nothing. All right. And the other contraindication would be uh, if they don't need it, if they're not bleeding. Okay. There is a, a small risk for increased blood clots in the hospital, uh, but we only use this for people who make us uncomfortable, the sick patients. The dose is two grams over 20 minutes. You could probably give it a whole lot faster than that. It comes pre-mixed, one gram in 100 mils. You can spike and hang and give two of those. If you got the vials, you can draw it up, put it in a bag of LR, bag of saline, 
if you have uh, patients that don't have ADHD, you can draw it up and push it slow IV push yourself. There's no way I can push it that slow myself. I'll count one Mississippi, two Mississippi, and then it'll be in, right? Questions or comments about trauma stuff today? This is the most quietest crowd I've ever seen. Questions, comments, statements within reason? Hey, Doc, we do have a couple online. Yes, sir. Got, the first one's a comment says one episode of hypoxia, SpO2 less than 93%, and traumatic brain injury increases mortality exponentially, just emphasizing that it's hypoxia and hypertension yep. that kill. Right. And the other one's a true question. Thoughts on finger thoracotomy as opposed to a chest tube, since it's the hole that is the life-saving procedure, not really the actual tube. Right. So that's also the, the big push these days is finger thoracostomies, right? So instead of putting a needle in somebody's chest, what you do is you prep the chest with some alcohol or betadine or nothing, and you make an incision with the scalpel and put your finger in, and you break through that pleura, and you release the tension. Um, I think that's reasonable for the surgeons or something to do in the hospital if you want to. Uh, my fear is if somebody's already got a pneumothorax and now a tension pneumothorax, they got probably have broken ribs and there's sharp edges of bone and stuff in there. And I don't really want to be sticking my finger in a place where I may get cut. So maybe it's just me being a chicken. I don't know. Um, I think that the big needles that we have probably work just as well. Uh, but it is a reasonable approach. I know the military talks about doing it. I think a more reasonable approach, something that I would do would be is I would make that quick incision and take some blunt scissors or some blunt forceps and puncture the pleural that way and get the air out. How about you, Doc? Dr. Payne or anybody? I mean, what do y'all do? Right, the whole, the whole idea is just try to get the air out, right? So, I mean, the needle works just as good as, as the finger. Um, I think, I, I agree. I think the bigger is probably reserved for uh, actually in the ER, the OR. Um, yeah. Because you can get the air out just easy with a needle. Right, yeah. So, it depends on what's going on, what the situation is, where you are. Um, it just depends. But the goal is get the air out. Yes, sir. I know that the, for the critical care protocols, that the, uh, the flight medics and nurses are doing chest tubes, if I'm not mistaken, with the new protocols coming out April 29th. So, they can do that, the advanced practice folks. So another quick another question is um, are we are we seeing evidence of increased field use of TXA in Alabama and have there been any lessons learned or anecdotal evidence coming back from the field about using TXA I know we're using it a lot more so some of the listservs that I subscribe to that have uh, air med programs and ground units in other states don't use it as much as we do as far as any different outcomes I do not know I know that uh, the deep south has a high rate of penetrating trauma and TXA helps with that. And then we also have a high rate of blunt trauma and no trauma centers. Uh, so it's very useful outside the city limits of Birmingham as well. So I, I personally like TXA. I think there's limited risk to it if you use it in the right population. Um, so that's the person that you think is about to die from hemorrhagic shock. It's not the guy that's got a you know a varicose vein that's leaking that you don't want to put a bandage on, right? It's the guy that's uh, diaphoretic, tachycardic, just shot in the belly, about to die in front of you. So limited risk, great benefit. So one more question that got texted in. Uh, could you clarify about when under the new protocols it, we're allowed to do needle chest decompression versus when we should do needle chest compression? Right. Not sure what's meant by that. But yeah. So chest decompression is done for attention to thorax. So you got to have a pneumothorax and you got to have signs of tension. Um, if you have that, a tension pneumothorax, I mean, a needle decompression will save somebody's life. Um, so it's not for the person that is hypoxic, hurting, and may have a pneumothorax. It's for the person that you clinically think, yeah, they're jacked up, they got a pneumothorax, and now they're either in cardiac arrest or they're altered and they're getting worse. So. Guy shot in the chest, GSW the chest. You think he's got a pneumothorax because he was shot in the chest. You've already listened to him. He's got diminished breath sounds. He's breathing fast. His sats are a little bit low. You put him on O2, head to the hospital. You start your IV, all right? Now the guy goes from a heart rate of 130 to a heart rate of 120, 110, 90, and becomes altered. 
I'm thinking he's a tension pneumothorax now, right? Because he's shot in the chest. Now he has signs of ultramental status and cardiovascular collapse. I probably will not cycle the blood pressure on this guy if he's altered, right? I'm gonna decompress his chest. I'm probably gonna give him what else? What else am I gonna give him real quick? TXA, right? So now I got signs of hemorrhagic shock too. It's for that person. Um, you can also use it on a flail chest. So if I got a guy who's got a flail chest that is now altered and I'm having to assist their ventilations, I'm probably gonna pop that side where that flail chest is as well, because I know that as I bag them, that pneumothorax is gonna get bigger and there's a big risk that they're gonna have a tension pneumothorax. If you have a flail chest, when you get to the hospital, you will get a chest tube. So it's not gonna hurt them. But it goes back to the medic understanding or recognizing does the patient have a pneumothorax? Now do they have a tension pneumothorax or do they have a flail segment? So I had a radio call several months ago about a patient that was hypoxic and altered hypotensive. And they had a pelvic fracture. Those things can bleed a lot because you got a lot of open uh, big vessels there. They called in and they said, hey, the patient is now more altered and hypoxic and hypotensive. Can I decompress the chest? And the question was, sure, if they have chest trauma, do they have any trust chest trauma? And the answer was no, it's all belly and pelvic. Their lungs are clear. I don't see anything going on with the chest. And so my answer was what? Do not poke the chest, okay? So our protocols really haven't changed much. The difference is now you as a medic have the responsibility and the authority to figure out what's going on and do the right thing. So if you can figure it out and do the right thing, it's wonderful. If you can't figure out and do the wrong thing, you're gonna hurt somebody. So the responsibility is back on you guys. We've been asking for years for this and now we got it, okay? All right, got a couple more questions came in. Uh, they're both about TXA. So TXA use with hemorrhage emergencies from dialysis and the follow-up on that or other medical causes such as a GI bleed. Yeah, so it's category A in uh, hemorrhagic shock and it's category A in uh, for significant head injuries like we talked about in the state. Um, you can use it for other things. Uh, so uh, it was, it's been used a long time for vaginal bleeding postpartum hemorrhage, things of that nature, you can do that. But again, I would, I would state that that would probably be cat B and you call for orders for that. You can use TXA and GI bleeds sometimes. So there was a big study, and I forgot the name of it. You remember the name of it? I can't. That looked at GI bleeds and TXA use. And the end result in that study was that TXA does not help people in, with GI bleeds and may worsen outcomes. However, when I look at the, the depth of that study, they put people in that had GI bleeds for several days and they get TXA with the same people that had that esophageal varices that are sitting there talking to you and vomit up bright red blood and then code on you, right? So TXA is only useful if you give it within the first three hours of bleeding. So for my practice, if I got somebody that's throwing up bright red blood or crapping bright red blood, I assume that's fairly new because you're not going to do that for three hours and be alive. So they get TXA if they're unstable. If I got a guy that's pale, has had a GI bleed for several days, it's been a slow trickle, and now he's at the end where he's fixing to crash because he's been, we didn't catch it, I'm not gonna give him TXA because he's been bleeding for more than three hours. Does that make sense? So that's my thought on that. Now, the, you ask another ER physician, some docs aren't gonna give TXA for GI bleeds, but I am if they're doing the bright red blood. And in our state, that would be a category B. Hey doc, I got a 54 year old male, He's vomiting bright red blood. Uh, he's a liver patient. I think he's got esophageal varices. Looks like dirt. I'm going to give TXA. Thank you. Click. And they say yes or no. Don't go click till they say yes or no. Awesome. We're going to get started back. Uh, we got Dr. Taylor Payne from UAB is going to be talking to us today about more trauma issues, specifically pelvis and extremities. So take it away, Doc. All right, guys, we're getting started here. So we're going to continue the, the trauma theme. We're going to talk about pelvis, uh, more lower abdomen pelvis, and then go over a little bit of the end, extremity trauma, uh, things you'll commonly see, how to manage those injuries. <clears throat> so pelvic trauma is fairly common. You'll see it mostly with uh, blunt injuries, right? So you'll see your big uh, high velocity MVCs. You can see these patients with a lot of uh, pelvic trauma. Um, there's you see some penetrating trauma uh, in the pelvis, probably not as much as the blunt trauma, okay? 
We're going to go over a little bit of anatomy, talk about uh, the peritoneum, what's inside of it, what's outside of it, why does it matter. Uh, we're going to talk about vascular injuries, right? Those are the things that will actually kill your patients in the pre-hospital setting, so it's important to think about those things and think about how you're going to manage them. And we'll talk about some penetrating trauma, pelvis, buttocks. Uh, we see fairly commonly around Birmingham, and then we'll talk about some GU trauma as well. So let's go over just a little bit of anatomy. So uh, the peritoneum is basically a sac inside of your abdominal cavity, okay? So it's not like all your organs are just hanging out in your abdominal cavity. There's a, a sac that contains some of the organs, okay? But not all the organs are inside that sac, inside the peritoneum. So you have some organs that are behind it, okay? So you can see here the retroperitoneal, meaning behind the peritoneum, are the, the items we've listed here, right? So aorta, uh, iliac arteries, um, uh, uh, vena cava, the IVC. You actually have your portion of your descending colon that is outside the peritoneum. And then everything else is inside your, your peritoneal sac, right? So most of the GU system in females, all of your uh, GI system in both males and females are located within that peritoneum. The bladder anteriorly is also located there as well. So when we talk about internal pelvic organs, right, we have the, the GU system the um, as well as the GI system, right? So pr pretty commonly we'll see in blunt trauma, um, well, not commonly, but you can't see a bladder rupture. It's more common in penetrating trauma though, right? So you can have a direct injury to the bladder right here in front. Um, usually the pubic symphysis sits right over it and somewhat protects it, but you can still see a GSW or stab wound come in and rupture the bladder. Is that life-threatening immediately? No, but it can cause infection when all that urine just spills out into the abdominal cavity. Um, the uterus also sits right behind, and of course in females, right behind the bladder, right? Kind of retroverted over the bladder here. Um, it's usually pretty small in non-pregnant non females, so it usually doesn't get injured. But of course in the gravid female or the pregnant female, that's going to be a, a greater increase of injury, right? It's a super vascular structure. So when this gets injured, uh, there's a lot of bleeding that can happen. You also see ureter injuries, right? So the ureter is uh, the passageway between the renal system, your actual kidneys and the bladder, right? So you got your kidneys, the ureter that travels all the way down to the bladder, and then your bladder with your urethra, which actually travels out, okay? So you can have injury to any one of those various systems. And then, of course, internal pelvic lower down, you can have part of the GI system, right? Most of the smaller small bowel is located higher up in the abdomen, but you can see a little bit more spill over into the pelvis. And then part of the large bowel, you, bowel uh, wraps around and empties out the rectum. So other things, of course, you got your external GU systems, penis, testes. Um, vascular injuries are uh, probably the biggest thing we worry about with pelvic injuries, right? It's the most life-threatening and also where EMS is the biggest potential for intervention. Uh, bony injuries are very common, right, uh, especially in NBCs. And then kind of like I talked about before, right, so here we have in this image, you can see the kidneys at the top, kind of more in the upper abdomen, right under the, the diaphragm, and this is all retroperitoneum, so this is not inside the peritoneum. Um, and then you have the ureter, which is the yellow, yellow little structure here that goes down, which empties into your bladder, and see how low your bladder sits, really the bottom part of the pelvis. And then you have the urethra out here. So any of those structures can be damaged. Um, so when these structures actually get damaged, whether it's blunt or penetrating, um, what, what surgeons will sometimes do is have to go in and stent open the ureter itself. So here is an example of that uh, being done. So you can see a stent coming from the bladder down here. They'll actually go in with a scope and then they'll actually track up this, this stent all the way back up to the kidney system. And so here the white White here is all contrast, so they've actually pushed contrast in here. You can see it in the bladder, and then it goes up and it actually fills into the, the kidneys up there, right? So that's for any kind of injuries involving the uh, urine. Like I've talked about before, bladder injuries, uh, mostly from penetrating trauma. You can see it sometimes from blunt trauma, but it's mostly from penetrating. You almost always requires operative fixation where they actually have to go in and repair it. Uh, the biggest risk with this is infection, right? All that urine and bacteria will spill out into the pelvic cavity. You usually don't get any hypotension or any bleeding issues with a, with a bladder injury in itself. So this is an example of a bladder injury. Uh, so on the left here is just a plain film. They've pushed contrast in, so that's why it's really wide. I know it's hard to see on the screen. But the a normal bladder should just, it should just fill up the bladder, right? Stay there. So all this extra right here is actually where the contrast is leaked out from a bladder rupture 
and you can see here as well. So this is actually a CT uh, taking a transverse slice. So like taking a, uh, a slice directly this way all the way down. Uh, we're looking back up towards the head. You can see the bladder here and you see the fill line in the bladder. And then all of this is where the contrast is leaked out from the, from the bladder. OK, again, urologist has to go in and actually repair this for um, infection get set in. Um, of course, external GU trauma, right? Um, so these are these are pretty rough, right? When we see them, usually they're not life threatening. You can sometimes get uh, injury to the arteries here, the, the the gonadal arteries, which can cause some bleeding. But most of the times, these are hemostatic. Uh, the big thing with these are going to be, um, you know, slap some wet gauze over it and then dry gauze, pain control, and then get it to definitive care. We see pretty commonly urethral injuries. Um, sometimes this just presents as you may see some actual obvious deformity or trauma. You may see some blood at the end of the penis or meatus. Um, and so what we have to do with those, if we're suspecting that at all, is we do what's called a retro a urethrogram. So this is a picture of it here on a plain film. So we actually, we actually go in and push contrast through the urethra and track it all the way to the bladder. So this is actually an old injury. This is a stricture through the urethra that we're seeing here, but you can see the same thing with the injury. The important thing while we do this is um, if you have a suspicion for a urethral injury, this is more for nurses and things like that, people in the ER, but we do this because if you place a Foley in somebody with an injury to the urethra, you're gonna cause more injury and the Foley can actually track and cause false tracks in there, right? So this is why we do this before a Foley. So again, if you have any concern for urethral injury, we do this test right here before we put a Foley. Again, testes, we've seen penetrating and blunt. Uh, GSW is, is the ones I'm most seeing. Sometimes we'll see uh, farm equipment injuries that has uh, injuries as well here. So let's get to the stuff that we can really help with, right? So penetrating, penetrating injuries, um, there's a huge potential for vascular issues in the pelvis and, and lower extremities especially. I mean, you can see, look at this vascular system, right? So we've got the aorta, the iliac arteries, and just look at all the different arteries that feed off to this pelvis. We'll talk about different type of pelvic fractures, but you can see how any type of fracture or disruptment, uh, just a little bit, you know, in the bony structures will just completely shear and rip these arteries, causing a huge amount of bleeding in the pelvis. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about the orthopedic injury. This is pretty cool if anybody's ever seen this. It's called, I think it's called the cheese wheel run or something. You can, okay, I, I see y'all shaking your head. You probably didn't. If you haven't seen it, go on YouTube and look this up. This is great. Uh, apparently these people like run down the hill and chase a cheese wheel just for fun. It's something in England they do. Um, so let's talk about the pelvis. So the pelvis is a ring structure, right? It's actually made up of three different bones, uh, ilium, ischium, and then the pubic symphysis right here is what connects these bones together. It's actually a little piece of cartilage here that connects them together, right? But of course it makes a ring, so it's fairly stable. <clears throat> There's three basic mechanisms of fracture that you will see in a, in a pelvic injury or, or pelvic trauma. So you can have lateral compression, right? So that'd be like a side end collision or T-bone, right? That's gonna be all your force coming over from the side, hitting the side of your pelvis. Anterior compression is the most common one we see, and that's where the force is gonna be head on. And then vertical shear, right? So this would be like somebody jumping off a building, jumping, you know, 20 feet, landing on their legs, and all that force goes straight through their femur, femur up into their pelvis, and it actually shears off part of the pelvis straight up. Okay, we'll talk about each one a little bit. So anterior posterior compression, this is going to be the one we see most often. This is going to be your, your, your average car wreck, you know, high rate of speed, head on collision. All the force from the car and the dash is transmitted up through the femur. If it doesn't break the femur, then it's going to go directly into the pelvis. Um, and you can see the force usually opens this pubic synthesis and breaks it. And then you'll also have a break in the back uh, so that it, it somewhat wings open this pelvis. Again, head-on car collisions, where you'll see this uh, uh, the most, is the most common uh, injury, and you can see it uh, a lot with femur fractures. So open book pelvis, you may have heard of this before. This is basically a extreme, extreme version of an anterior posterior compression. Uh, so this, you can see here, the, the uh, pubic synthesis is completely disrupted and the, the bones are basically spread open, kind of winged open. Um, this is a really high risk for life-threatening hemorrhage. So you can see here, uh, the space inside the pelvis is opened, right? So it's not a confined space from that ring anymore. 
So all that does is increase the volume of your pelvis and it allows that much more bleeding to accumulate there. And that's why these can be so severe. Again, this is another illustration. You can see here the open book, right? You see the pubis synthesis is disrupted. It's opened up and this volume just increases here. So what can we do for this? So we can stabilize the pelvis. This is why we check for is the pelvis uh, unstable in the pre-hospital setting. So uh, there's a there's a theoretical theoretical benefit if we can close that uh, open book kind of back into anatomical position and keep it more stable, then it would limit the amount of bleeding, right? That's going to line up those fracture lines and that could help with some of the shearing of the arteries like we saw uh, earlier. So how, how do we do this, right? So hopefully the patient's on a flat surface. You're going to put both your arms on each side of the pelvis and you're going to rock back and forth, okay? Of course, the patient's going to scream at you if there's fracture there, but you will feel, you know, each side will move independently of the other, and that's how you know that you have an unstable, unstable fracture, pelvic fracture. <clears throat> like I talked about, so press firmly down, rock back and forth. Uh, you'll know you'll know if it's unstable because you'll feel crepitus and you'll you'll feel them move independently. So ways to stabilize the pelvis, right? They, they make some fancy uh, pelvic stabilizers that you can buy, um, but honestly, a sheet will do just as well. So this specifically for those uh, you know high high velocity NBCs, you think they have, may have an open book, you feel their pelvis, they're unstable, wrap a sheet around there that will close the pelvis back together and it will prevent bleeding. These are some of the uh, commercial products you, you'll see used. Um, there's various kinds, some are inexpensive, some are more expensive. The, in, the end result, you're just trying to get that pelvis back together. So if you can do it with a sheet, then do it with a sheet, that's fine. This is another example of one. You can see how it's pulled across fairly tight to get it back into uh, position. Again, this is going to be pretty painful for the patient, so you're going to have to be uh, aggressive with pain control. Again, the position, right? The position is important because we're really trying to get that pubic synthesis back together. We're trying to close that open book. So you don't want to go too high um, over the ischium up here. You don't want to be too low because that's just going to work on, you know, pulling your, your femurs together. You want to be right over the uh, bottom portion. And, and if you look at a patient and you think, okay, I'm going to bind their pelvis. Most people will actually go too high. They'll go up here with kind of the upper hips together, but you really should be over the the lower portion of the lower portion of their pelvis here. All right, so lateral compression. This is mostly seen with uh, side collisions, NBCs, T-bone collisions. There's a less risk for vascular injury, um, but you can see a ton of different fractures and they'll be on both sides, right? So they'll be on the side of impact and you can have a fracture site on the other other side of the pelvis as well. So you'll see many fractures with this. Again, the, the risk of bleeding is not as much as an open open book. You will still feel that same pelvis instability. So on these patients, I think it's reasonable to also bind their pelvis if you have uh, the ability to do that. And then vertical shear. So, so these are the ones that are, are really dangerous because they involve a lot of shearing forces, right? So basically all this one side can be disrupted right here. All those little vessels will be broken. And also if you bind the pelvis back together, again, it's still not going to bring it back to an anatomical alignment. So there's really not a good way of fixing this. So in the ER, what we actually have to do for these patients when they're bleeding out from pelvis fractures is we have to call in our um, radiology guys. They can come in and shoot a dye and see which vessel is actually bleeding, and then they'll go emergently in and embolize that uh, artery that's bleeding. And that's the only way to stop it, really. All right, so just overall view, right? Treatment for pelvic traumatic injuries is always ABC, ABCDE with any other thing when we talk about trauma. IV access is really important, um, not, in, not only in general trauma, but in these specifically, because you can lose so much blood in the pelvis. You're going to do your primary primary trauma survey and then you're going to proceed on to secondary to look for other life threats. Of course, any open wounds, you're going to stabilize those, direct pressure, trauma guys, all that good stuff. If there's any genital degloving injuries like we talked about before, put a wet saline gauze over it, make sure to give the patient pain control and get them to definitive care. And then the other biggie is if you think they have an unstable fracture, try to do something to bind it back together until you get to the hospital. All right, so let's talk about extremity injuries real quick. 
So <clears throat> extremity injury is very common, right? Very common, most of the time not life-threatening, right? There are a few that are life-threatening that we need to know about uh, because there's something that we can actually fix in the field, right? And that's usually going to be bleeding, bleeding risk. So extremity, trauma, uh, extremity injuries are associated with about a 10% um, mortality if it involves the vascular system, and that's any, any uh, extremity injuries. Uh, the most common uh, issues that we see when we think about extremity injuries are the, the, the femur fractures, right? Femur fractures, knee fractures, knee dislocations, things like that. So initial assessment with extremity injury, you're going to, of course, perform your primary survey. You're going to provide immediate resuscitation for any other tra traumatic uh, injury that you see, and then you'll work on secondary survey. And the one caveat to that is if you see life-threatening hemorrhage, right? If you see a life-threatening hemorrhage on extremity, you're going to go to that first, right? You're going to you're going to put direct pressure. Um, if you had combat gauze or other kind of uh, applications to put on, you can do that. And then you can, you know, you're doing that, still bleeding out, then you step up to a tourniquet. Again, it's important to remember a, a lot of these extremity injuries can look pretty gruesome, right? An open fracture, it's going to look terrible. And sometimes when you come up on scene, you got your adrenaline going, you're going to want, you know, you, you're going to want to focus on that, but you got to look at the patient as a whole, right? They may have somewhat normal looking abdomen, yet they're bleeding out in their abdomen and there's some other uh, interventions you can do and not worry about that extremity injury with the one caveat ble uh, being that they're, they're bleeding out through that extremity. So let's talk about tourniquets a little bit. I know Dr. Furr talked about some. Um, so they were actually used less during the Vietnam War. Um, they, they, the thought was, oh, it's a last resort. Um, and the, the reason behind this was uh, in World War I, World War II, there was such long transport time to definitive care. So when somebody was shot in extremity, they would autom automatically place a tourniquet. Uh, and then by the time they got into the hospital, you know, or definitive OR, four or five hours later, the, the extremity would basically be dead, right? So that's kind of why it was less used um, in World War II and Vietnam. But then came the um, Iraqi war and they were used all the time, right? We had more rapid transport and it was really, you know, we found, hey, this is actually saves a lot of lives. So that's why uh, all the different things you've seen over the last 20, 30 years have been pushing tourniquets uh, in the field, not only in the military setting, but in the pre-hospital setting. So this is one of your basic uh, tourniquets. Um, this is called the, the CAT Combat Application Tourniquet, right? It's a windless tourniquet. So windless is the name of this little device here. So it's not like without wind or something, right? It's this, this is the name of the, the windless. So you wrap it around the arm, like Dr. Perk talked about, right? High and tight. You don't want to put it over someplace that has two bones like the forearm. You uh, put it around, you attach it, and then you just crank down this uh, windless. And then you can put it in this little slot here that will hold the windless in place. And that's what holds the tension. Um, the good thing about this one is it can be applied with one hand. You can see a lot of the military guys, their uniform has built-in tourniquets uh, actually in their, the uniforms, so they always have it in the right spot and they can just crank it up if they need to. This is a different ver uh, version, the soft the tap the tactical uh, tourniquet, very similar to the CAD. It has the same windless device. Uh, the strap is a little bit uh, different, smaller, but you'll see this one too used in the pre-hospital setting. This one I haven't seen as much in the pre-hospital setting. It's more of a military device. Um, if you look, it's, it's basically a blood pressure cuff, right? It's a blood pressure cuff that you can pump up and that will cause occlusion of the artery. The bad thing with this is that if any part of that blood pressure cuff gets um, punctured, right, you're going to lose your ability to create pressure and, and occlude the artery. So we talked about applying a, a tourniquet, right? You're going to apply directly to the skin or over clothing. Uh, you know, I would argue that you try to take off clothing before you apply a tourniquet. It's going to be high and tight, right? Tighten. Uh, your, your, the goal is to stop the bleeding, right? So you're going to tighten it until distal perfusion is gone, right? You shouldn't have a pulse below the tourniquet, and that's the goal. And like Dr. Ferg said, these are going to be very painful. Um, so you got to be aggressive with pain control, but you're going to save somebody's life. Um, we see this actually used a lot in people that have um, fistula or graft bleeds, right? Because they'll have a little injury, they're bleeding profusely, do direct pressure, right? Maybe if you have combat guy, if you do that, hey, it's still bleeding out. What do I do? Well, you can place a tourniquet above it. But these patients are otherwise not injured, they're not altered, right? So you really have to be aggressive with pain control because you've got to crank it down to where it's super painful to actually include that artery. If you're able to, um, you know, if you have the time to, if you can just note the time that you place the tourniquet, a lot of times the surgeons won't want to know that. 
just to see how, how much um, ischemia time they have in that lamp. Again, a blood pressure cuff, if for some reason you don't have a tourniquet, a blood pressure cuff can be used too. Um, just you got to remember that if that uh, blood pressure cuff gets damaged, you're not going to be able to hold pressure anymore. All right, so let's move on a little bit more distal, right? Let's talk about hand and arm injuries. Uh, of course, hand injuries are very common. Um, let's talk about amputated injuries, right? So what what do y'all, what's your go-to thing for if you have an amputated digit? What, what do you want to do with it? What now? Bag it, okay. Bag it and then put it in sailing. Is that what I heard? Okay, good. The biggest thing with these is you don't want to put them on direct ice, okay? Um, so this is the proper way to, if you have an amputated digit that you need to take to the ER, right? So wrap it in bandage, you can do dry bandage, place it into a watertight bag, and then place that into ice, okay? You never wanna actually push, place the digit directly on ice because that will actually cause the digit to freeze. Once it's frozen, you've caused uh, irreversible damage to the, to the digit. I think it's also important to think that, uh, to remember that even if you save the digit and bring it with the patient, a lot of these patients are still not able to have it reattached. You know, I feel like a lot of people think, oh, we got to save it and bring it in. It is important to do that, but you got to remember over 90% of these uh, amputations are not going to be able to be re uh, implanted on the patient. So this is a boxer's fracture, right? So this is super common. So this is somebody getting in a fight, right? Uh, they'll fracture that uh, metatarsal there. So very common injury, uh, could be pretty painful. Um, so all we do here is we just pull until these bones are back in alignment, and place a cast and send them on to the hand specialist. Usually uh, they heal well without any issues. You can see sometimes what's called a, a, a fight bite, which is uh, where you are, and it can be in a conjunction with a boxer fracture as well, but basically you have somebody that's fighting and they hit somebody's teeth and the teeth actually cause a laceration over the joint. It's called a fight bite. The reason that's so bad is because that has just seeded all the mouth bacteria from that person right into the joint. Okay, so these are a surgical emergency. These have to be taken to the OR and washed out if you see any kind of laceration from a bite that has gone into the joint space. So this is just normal failings from finger fracture. Um, again, very common. Um, these most of the time don't even have to be reduced. We can just put them in a small finger plant and have them follow up. And that's all we do for those. So this is probably the most common um, extremity fracture that you'll see, right? This is called a collies fracture, or basically just a distal radius and distal ulnar fracture. This is caused by uh, what we call a thush injury or a fall on an outstretched hand, right? It's very common. What happens is just all the force creates the little tip part of these two bones to break and it pops up like that. You'll see this, what the, what's called a dinner fork deformity. Super common in kids as well. Um, we just give them some sedation in the ER, pull on it and reduce it, get them a cast, and usually they heal pretty well. And then the opposite of this fracture is the Smith's fracture. Um, so this is basically, instead of somebody falling on a foosh, where they're falling out front with their arm this way, a lot of the time this is the elderly, if they lose balance, fall backwards, and they try to catch themselves and their arms are, are actually like this it will cause a fracture of the distal part of the radius and ulnar, and, but it'll just break it off in the, the opposite direction as, as the colleague's fracture. Again, we just said aid and reduce them and have them follow up with orthopedic surgeons. So let's shift gears a little bit, talk about upper extremity injuries. Um, elbow dislocation, pretty rare, but you may see it. It usually involves pretty pretty good amount of force to cause this, and it's usually uh, associated with a fracture. Right, um, we've seen a few recently um, sports related injuries. Again, this is sometimes a foosh injury, fall and outstretched hand. And the force, instead of breaking a bone, it'll actually just, the force will be transmitted to the elbow and it'll cause a dislocation like this. Now, as you can imagine, all these ligaments in here are usually pretty torn up. So this would be a somewhat uh, unstable injury. And a lot of the times these patients have a lot of long-term uh, effects down the road. Arthritis, things like that. Humerus fracture, very common in the elderly. Um, it depends on where exactly the fracture is, what we do with them, but a lot of times these also can be just cast and followed up. Um, you'll see these very common in the elderly, kind of up here near the neck of the humerus, and sometimes we don't do a lot with these at all. They're self-stabilizing, 
um, and they can heal up even without a cast. So we'll just put them in a sling and have a follow up as needed with orthopedic surgery. So shoulder dislocation, right? Fairly common. Uh, I feel like some people, you know, you'll see these a lot because they're they're prone. Once you have one dislocation, you're prone to have more dislocations. So sometimes you see these patients over and over again. There's three different types, anterior, posterior, inferior. Anterior is the most common. Uh, you'll see a posterior dislocation sometimes. Anybody know when you would see a posterior dislocation possibly? So it's a one specific situation. So it's actually people that have frequent seizures will, will dislocate their, their shoulder in the posterior direction, okay? And that's because of the, the larger muscles in the back when they're seizing, it will actually pull that shoulder out of place and cause a posterior dislocation. So not nearly as common uh, as the anterior, but we do see it sometimes. So again, uh, initial assessment with any extremity injury, the biggest thing is life-threatening hemorrhage, right? That's the biggest thing we wanna know. Is there something we can intervene on right away that's gonna save this patient's life? Life-threatening hemorrhage, right? So direct pressure, combat gauze, and then a tourniquet as needed. In the EMS world, we always talk about pulse motor sentry, right? So that's important to know. Does the patient have no normal motor? Are there distal pulses, right? That injury under the surface that we're missing. And then a nerve injury, right? All these three things are super important to, to uh, let us know when we get to the ER to see how emergent of a fracture this is. Any open fractures, right? So open fractures are extremely important. They are uh, very prone to infection. Um, so we have to be aggressive up front with antibiotics. Uh, you'll see actually in the new protocols, there's options for um, antibiotics to be given by the advanced level, right? Advanced level. So you'll see ceftriaxone and one other antibiotic, um, uh, ANCEF. Um, I think a lot of that was put in the protocol for this reason, right? So early antibiotic administration for open fractures. Again, that's not a required drug per the state. So depending on your agency, you may or may or may not carry it. But this would be a great place to use the use those drugs in conjunction with your medical director if that's what you decide to do. So you've looked at life-threatening hemorrhage, you've assessed pulse motor sensory, you know, you've looked, is there an open fracture? You're going to stabilize your fractures as best you can. You're going to treat your pain and then take them to a definitive OR. Again, talking about uh, open fractures, right? So this is an open femur fracture. So what, what can be some issues here? What are some obvious issues or maybe not so obvious issues? What do y'all think? Bleeding? Yeah. So bleeding is a big one, right? So, you know, one of your major arteries runs right beside your femur all the way down and then passes behind your knee and goes into your lower extremity, right? So there's huge risk for um, for arterial bleed here. And then also you got to remember, you can actually bleed a lot into the thigh and cause a lot of, uh, and, and cause a life-threatening hemorrhagic shot just from the amount of blood you can lose in the thigh. So if you have a su subtle disruption of artery and you see this thing swelling and swelling and swelling, you got to be like, okay, I got to get out the axis and think about giving TXA. Okay. Pretty great picture, right? Uh, it's rough. All right, so traction splints, there's some kind of controversy around traction splints. Um, it's supposed to be used for mid shaft femur fractures, and it's really for people that you know don't have any fractures to their knee, and you know they don't have any fractures to their pelvis, right? So it's kind of hard to tell that in the pre hospital setting. Uh, some places use them, some places don't. I think it's I think it's appropriate if you are an agency that may have a long transport because it will help with pain and it can help with some vascular stability if you have them. Um, what are your thoughts on that for traction splints? Yeah, I mean, times that you miss an underlying acetab fracture or something else. Yeah. So I know in the trauma bay, we usually just take these femur fractures and put a knee immobilizer on them just to immobilize it and then go from there. You need traction long term, but in the short term, I'm not a big fan anymore. Yeah. Who here has yeah. used a traction splint on somebody besides the folks in the back that are mature? <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. So folks are still using them. Okay. Yeah. Again, the, the key thing is any, anything you did to a patient, you got to reassess after you do it. Did it help them? Did it hurt them or not do anything? So put a traction splint on and they're in worse pain or you lose perfusion to it, that distal limb take it off right yeah i feel like it also used to be taught that once you place a traction plant you can never take it off right i feel like that used to be taught 
But what's the first thing you see in the trauma bay, right? If somebody has that on, rip it off, right? So I think I think it's kind of gone to the wayside a little bit. You know, again, maybe you can make an argument if you have a system that's going to be doing long transports. But other than that, I, I don't think there's a huge, huge need for it. So, do, Dr. Payne, we did have a question that kind of tied into that. Yeah. Uh, about the amputations. It says, for those of us in the Birmingham area with quick transport times, do you think it's important to take the time to find ice and put on an amputation on ice or bypass that? and just concentrate on quick transport? Uh, I mean, yeah, if you're, if you're quick, you can get to the hospital quickly. I don't think you have to take the time because we can do that in, in the ER if we need to. Yeah, I would also caution that quick geographical transport time does not necessarily mean quick handoff. That's also time. right. What if you sit on the uh, wall for two hours? You know? If you're but sitting it, on the wall with an amputation, please email me. Just, just, just say it, let me know. That should not be the case. And the other thing, if you're going to use a traction splint, you got to expose the patient's pelvic area and look for injuries. Uh, I've seen these splints put on and people have like, you know, open pelvic fractures or big lacks or things like that. So if you're using the traction splint, make sure you expose the area you're going to put it on there so you know you're not putting over another wound and hurt them. I, I put this slide in there because um, I feel like there's somewhat of a, a misconception about knee dislocation. So there's really two different types of of what we call knee dislocations. There's a true knee dislocation where you actually have the femur and the um, tibia actually dislocate, right? And that's going to be, you know, huge emergency because you have a lot of risk for vascular injury. Some patients will come in and say, oh, I had a knee dislocation, but what they actually mean is they had a patellar dislocation, right? So you can see this is a picture of one here on the right where the patella actually will slip over to the side. These are, um, more common in, in younger patients, right? They're pretty painful because that the patella is putting pressure on all those tendons now over to the side. These are actually pretty easy to reduce. You just straighten the knee and they'll pop back in place. But this is very different than an actual true knee dislocation because you have with a true knee dislocation, you have a huge risk for a vascular injury. And that, that's basically a, a orthopedic emergency at that time. That's my best slide in here. Ankle fracture dislocations, again, very common. Um, there is uh, uh, less risk for vascular compromise, but you can see depending on the de degree of dislocation, right? Also, pretty commonly, you'll see these as open fractures as well, too. And if they become open, then that just increases the risk for vascular and uh, neurocompromise in those extremities. All right, so again, to kind of wrap things up, initial assessment management is extremity injuries, right? We're looking for life-threatening hemorrhage. That's the most important thing that we can do in the pre-hospital setting to actually save somebody's life. And then you want to assess for pulse motor sensory, right? Can they actually move it? Do they have distal pulses or do they have good distal looking perfusion, right? If you, if you have a gray ashen looking extremity, you know, you're going to be like, oh, that doesn't have good perfusion. Nerve injury. Open fracture is important to think about, especially if you're going to be working with the new protocols and actually be thinking about giving early antibiotics. You're going to stabilize those fractures as well as you can. You're going to treat patient's pain aggressively. And then you're going to, of course, defend, uh, deliver to definitive care. So overall, the big, big takeaways, ABC's primary survey. We remember the five places somebody can bleed to death. Y'all know the five places? Just uh, as far as places on the body. What now? Yep. Long ball, and then one other. On the ground, right, so bleed out, yeah. So chest, abdomen, pelvis, thigh, and then on the ground. Those are the five places you can bleed to death. Again, think about the pelvis. You gotta realize it can hold a large a large volume of blood. So you gotta you got be aggressive with your um, resuscitation. Um, large bore IV access, maybe give a, a fluid bolus and get them to the hospital quickly. Give TXA, and then if you're an agency that has blood, get blood. Pelvic fractures, uh, again, common and MVCs. Be on the lookout for an open book pelvis, right? Because those are the ones that need a pelvic binder that can help with hemorrhage. Um, if you're placing a tourniquet, if you can, try to write the time down. And then we talked about extremity injuries, PMS. All right, that's all I had. Y'all have any questions in here for me? Yeah. I read what situations are the extremities which have to amputate or like As far as if it was if it was like stuck or crashed in or something. So the question was about like extremity amputations in the field. I think that'd be pretty uncommon, right? I think I would focus on 
trying to extricate and get the, the car outside of the patient. Um, and I would probably focus on that for a while and continue resuscitation before you'd have to do anything like that. Again, that's going to be rare. That's going to be like a one, you know, once in 10 year thing. Yeah, question over here. Open fracture on the femur and a dislocated pelvis or like a broken pelvis. How would you control? Yeah, so yeah, so um, I, if I had both of those, I would I would uh, bind the pelvis, right? So that would maybe help with your pelvis fracture. Um, if you have external bleeding of your femur, then you can do a tourniquet, right? But if it's just um, internal bleeding, you're going to be thinking about IV access, resuscitation, TXA, rapid transport to the hospital. Yep. Yeah, I, I've never seen that personally. So the question was, if, if you have a concern for losing uh, perfusion distally after you bind the pelvis, I think that, it, you know, that is a concern. If you do that, then you may have to just weigh the risk benefit, right? Everything we do is risk benefit. So, you know, um, you, you may want to loosen that up. But again, if they're just losing a perfusion to that extremity, that's still, you know, they may not have the extremity, but then they're at least not bleeding to death in their pelvis, right? So it's kind of a risk benefit. But I've never personally seen that where you have a vascular injury. Yeah, that's good. So one question has come up is, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, what what's the difference between crush syndrome and compartment syndrome? So. Uh, compartment syndrome is where you actually have the, the, the your extremities are, um, they're basically built, the anatomy of your extremities are built where there are different compartments and there's different muscle groups within a compartment. The issue with that is there's thick connective tissue in those compartments. So if you have swelling uh, for whatever reason, a fracture injury to those compartments, they can actually swell and there's nowhere for that extra pressure to go, right? So the compartments will get to a point where they're so full and swollen that it'll actually limit blood flow to the areas. So that is what your classic compartment syndrome is. As far as crush syndrome, I don't know if there's a specific thing they're talking about. You know, you'll see sometimes what we think of like crush injuries where they'll have um, potassium and different electrolytes leak. Is, I, I guess that's what they're talking about. Yeah, so that's, that's different. That's looking more generally at the whole body, right? So that's going to be somebody's crushed and then when you're taking them out of that scenario you'll have a lot of release of potassium from the damaged muscle cells and that can cause dysarrhythmias and cardiac arrest from that in itself and what are we going to do with that if we see that calcium 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 so i think that's what they were talking about there. yep so got a couple more from online the first one is what's your opinion on the use of junctional tourniquets junctional tourniquets you got to be more specific or clarify yeah, so I think what they're talking about is the tourniquet that has the pneumatic uh, like uh, triangle that goes around the waist that cuts off blood supply from that point below the body. So it's kind of like an like exterior a version of Reboa. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm going to have to defer to the elderly experts in the room. <laughs> yeah. That means you, yeah. yeah. I think that's the way to break pressure. Am I too close to this mic? Okay, you got a pointed at your mouth. Oh. To uh, put direct pressure on the aorta. Uh, so there's some utility in those plate for those uh, devices. Uh, it's probably a few and far between, so. Is that how that works like that? Yeah, that's how it works. Very good. Thank you. Sorry about that. All right. So um, the other question that came in was absent pulses. Would you advise reductions in the field? Weary or, or wary, I guess is what they meant to say, of further vascular damage or just rapid transport to definitive? I'd probably lead towards rapid transport. I know this question has been brought up before, right? If you have a, you know, a extremity that's not being perfused. Um, yes, you want to get it reduced as quick as possible. I don't know if in the field if that would be the appropriate place to do it or not. You might have other ideas. It depends. So if you got somebody with a uh, uh, angulated left leg and the left leg is cold and blue, yeah, as you're moving toward the trauma center, pulling that thing, try to get it straight, get perfusion back to it. 
So uh, you do it with trauma, you do your care in route, right? So you move in towards the hospitals, you take care of them because they need a surgeon. But if it's cold and blue, I would try to pull on it and try to get it better. I'm not going to do that over an airway or access and TXA or blood products, but we're going to do that. Very good. Any other questions from uh, the group here with us? I've right. got a couple extra points I want to talk about. One, I think we've kind of both stressed sick patients. You have to expose them to look for injuries. Um, so the patient with knee pain since 1972, yeah, just look for the knee, do your vitals, do what you got to do, right? But someone that's got unstable vital signs, somebody altered, you get them naked. You look for things that kill people so you don't miss those things. I could tell you horror stories about people who miss those injuries. They've been to begin with, but you feel bad. Yeah, let me swap with you. Uh, but the job is to recognize these injuries, right? So I can recognize somebody has a hip bleed, but I can't take them to the OR and fix that. I will kill you if I open your skull up in the OR. You would die, right? But I should recognize the people that need a neurosurgeon, just like you should recognize the people that need a trauma surgeon or a cardiologist for a STEMI or an ER doc. Um, the GU injuries that he mentioned, um, those things are associated with high-risk pelvic injuries, so urethral injuries, uh, things that happen down there and get people hurt. Uh, a lot of times, they, the injury itself may not be life-threatening, but it could be life-altering. The big risk is pelvic or intra-abdominal injuries that kill people. Um, when you're doing your pelvic exam on somebody, a lot of times in the uh, textbooks talk about doing a pelvic rock, and it's not rocking the pelvis. It's a gentle manipulation of the pelvic bones to see if they cuss or yell at you or it moves. If it does, you're done. You just do it once. Remember, you got big bone shards. You can do vascular damage, okay? If you're looking at the guy and his hips are bruised, his pelvic is bruised up, he's altered, he's got broken femurs, you probably don't even have to do a pelvic rock. You can assume he's got a pelvic fracture, right? Um, so be careful with that. The knee versus patella dislocation, that will trick you. There was actually a patient this weekend that came in. Uh, they brought in, they, I looked at the guy's knee, and I said, oh, man, that knee is dislocated. So I upgraded him, took him back to trauma bay, and lo and behold, it was a fractured patella and not a dislocated knee. You would get bit by that. I really, you get bit and be wrong and upgrade them and get them to the right place and then get bit by being wrong and not catching that dislocated knee, which somebody could actually lose their entire leg from. High risk injuries for the dislocated knee would be obese people, low speed MBAs, their foot gets stuck on the, uh, the floorboard and then all the weight shifts forward and they get dislocated. So look for those things. Um, we talked pretty heavy about the things that matter. Remember um, the history should guide how fast you approach your patient. Uh, you don't have to get in the weeds with that. When you give your ready report, uh, to the hospitals, be quick and efficient. It should be less than like 20 seconds. It's basic stuff. You know, 20-ish year old male, MCC, after GCS of four, hypotensive tachycardic. I'm working on airway. I see you in a minute. We don't need 20-year-old guy hanging out at the Walmart. He's got a cool pill on his back that says, I love chickens. You know, you don't want all that detail, right? And when you get to the trauma base, same thing, quick and efficient pertinent information and then walk around the corner and tell the nursing staff or whatever physicians back there with you the detailed stuff. Um, but you know, all us ER docs have ADHD. We can't listen for a long time. New protocols, a lot of responsibility. Make sure you know them They're on the web page. There's no way to cover them all in these lectures. And then the last thing I wanted to say is uh, thanks again for Birmingham Fire for having us out here. For those that don't know, uh, Birmingham Fire is doing a lot of things with UAB Department of Emergency Medicine. So we have our fellows and our residents riding with them right now doing field care. You should see them out there. We're out going out to different hospitals, taking patients in with them. Uh, the other thing is uh, we have a uh, School of Medicine has an EMT class now for the med students to get pre-hospital experience. And they start clinicals with Birmingham Fire next month. So a lot of big things going on in downtown Birmingham. So any other questions or comments, statements within reason? We got a skill lab here in about an hour, hour and a half. We're going to do surgical airways on pig tracheas, and that's somebody stole them from the front deck out there. We got mega code scenarios. We're going to do airway management. We got a mannequin that's got a lot of vomit in it. I like vomit, it's pretty fun. 
Uh, and then we're going to have the uh, ultrasound rep. I can't pronounce the name of the machine, so I want to try. And we do some ultrasound training too. So questions, comments, comments? Yep. So for those of us, uh, you here live, uh, food will be here in a little while. We do have lunch provided for you. Just hang out. Please don't leave. And we probably get the skills started around 1230 um, and, and carry that all the way to 230. If you're online and you're anywhere close to Southside Birmingham, you can still come by and participate in skills with us. Everybody, please remember to fill out a participation form, one form per person, please. If you're here live, you can scan the QR code that's on the flyers around the room. Um, if you're online with us, then you can click the, the link in the chat feature. Or if for whatever reason that doesn't work for you, you can send an email to alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com. You'll get an automated reply with a link to the form. The password for today's attendance form is the word trauma. Trauma is the password for today's form. That's all I got. Is that all you got? Dr. Ferguson. All right. Well, hey, thanks everybody for participating. We'll see you next time.